Other than a number of small groups of pygmies living in the Rwanda, Burundi, Eastern Congo area, a small group of Adzabi bushmen living near Lake Iyasi in Tanzania, and three scattered groups of bushmen of the Kalahari living in Namibia and Botswana, and possibly also a small group in Angola, no other near true hunter-gatherers were thought to exist in southern and central Africa by the turn of the last century. Part 1 of this film covered my search to find other remnant groups of true hunter-gatherers that might possibly still be living in Namibia, after having received information that such people are still to be found in the Zebra Mountains of northwestern Namibia. Information to this effect was given to me by Jalepa Jambiro, a member of the Vatwa tribe, in December 2002, whilst I was travelling along the Konini River, which forms the northern border of Namibia with Angola. According to Jalepa, there were hunter-gatherers of his own tribe still living in the Zebra Mountains, south of Enyandi. They were apparently completely dependent on hunting and the gathering of felt foods for their survival and also manufactured their own iron hunting weapons by melting ore obtained from the Zebra Mountains. The Zebra Mountains lie just south of the Kanini River and spans an area 75 kilometers long by 40 kilometers wide. The terrain is rugged and most inaccessible, except for the Nyandi Valley, which penetrates the mountain range for a distance of more than 30 kilometers and, according to my topographical maps, would provide access into the mountains. In July 2004, I returned with my wife and two friends to Nyandi to go and search for the hunter-gatherers that Jalepa had referred to. On arrival, we found out that Jalepa Jambiro had died since. We found two Himba cattle herders who agreed to guide us into the mountains. We walked for two days, covering almost the full length of the valley. We came across one person only. Possibly previously a hunter-gatherer, he was now herding a small herd of cattle in the valley. Right near the end of the valley, we also came across three children playing in the sand. When they saw us, they disappeared into the bush. We found no signs of cattle or goats in the area. We did notice some Mahongo patches, indicating that the people who lived there led an agronomical existence. They were therefore not exclusively dependent on hunting and gathering of food. We then went onto the mountain plateau and found a place where there was permanent running water, ample signs of game and no sign of cattle farming, an ideal area for hunting and gathering, but with no sign of any people living nearby. Despite all our efforts to find the hunter-gatherers that Chalepa Jambero had referred to, we were not successful. However, we now had a much better idea of the conditions in the mountains. In part 2 of this film, I continued with my search, this time just south of the Zebra Mountains, at Okahauraure. I came across a group of Vatwas, still heavily dependent on hunting and gathering. They did also, however, plant Mahongo, and were therefore not true hunter-gatherers anymore. They showed me how they manufactured their spear and arrow tips. And how they use their bows and arrows to hunt. I also witnessed their traditional dancing. And music. And 
After our limited success in finding hunter-gatherers in the Zebra Mountains, our attention moved to an even more remote area of Namibia, the Baines Mountains. We had information suggesting that there may still be hunter-gatherers there, relying largely on the collection of wild honey. They were, in fact, locally referred to as the honey people of the Baines Mountains. If we again look at the map of the area in northwestern Namibia, commonly known as Cahoka Land, we see Angola. And there is Namibia, The Konini River forms the international border. The Skeleton Coast National Park borders the western side of the Kahuka land. The well-known Ipupa Falls lies in the extreme northwestern corner of Kahuka land. There is Okongwati, the only significant urban settlement of Himbas. The Baines Mountains lie immediately west of Ipupa Falls and northwest of Okongwati. These mountains rise 1,300 meters above the surrounding flatlands and plateau at 2,100 meters above sea level, which is only 300 meters lower than the highest point in Namibia. The plateau is extremely remote with no road access. The dark green areas represent the highest parts of the plateau. We were hoping to find the hunter-gatherers there. Travelling along a faint track towards the mountains early in April 2005, we came across some cattle and could see from the condition of the felt that grazing did occur all along the base of the Baines Mountains. We came across these two Himba women collecting Mupani worms. The worms are gathered, dried and roasted and stored as a rich source of proteins until winter when food is scarce. The temperature was approaching 40 degrees Celsius. Late afternoon, we reached a small Himba community at a place known as Ochikoyo, where the tracks stopped. Unexpectedly, we came across this mobile tented school at Ochikoyo. This represented the current interface between those still practicing a Neolithic lifestyle and modern society. <laughs> Isi? Isi Mumbu. Mumbu? Ja. Oorspronkelijk van waar af? Van Ocherunda. Ocherunda. Ocherunda en Opose Omgeving. Ja. Mm. Vertel net vir my bykie hier, wat maak jy hier so? Ek is eindelijk nou onderwijzer hier so. Ja. Vir hen die mense, hinba mense, wat nou bykie achtergelos was. Ja, ja, ja. Ek is, ek is nou hier so om hulle bykie te onderrug. Ja, ja, ja. Sondat hulle nou bykie na die beskaving toekom. Ja, ja. ja. Wat is hierdie plek se naam? Hierdie plek se naam is Ochikoyo. Ochikoyo. En hy ja. is nie baie ver van, uh, Ochi, uh, uh, van Okongwati af nie, nee. Uh, dit is omtrend 46 kilometer van Okongwati af. Ja. 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 En sê dit vir my, uh, die... die Die onderwijzer, die, 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 die himbas wat jy nou by die school leer, nee. Hmm. Ek neem aan, jy moet recht voor begin, nee. Hulle is, uh, hulle is heel te mal, hulle het glad nie een formele onderrug nie, nee. Hulle glad nie, glad, glad nie. nie. Hmm. So jy moet hulle leer om goed soos hand en oogcoordinatie en al die goed is, dat hulle de skerr kan snij en sikke goed ook alles. Natuurlijk, ja. Ja, ja, ja. En uh, tot hoe oud kan jy hulle hanteer hier so voor hulle nou te oud is vir jou school? Nee, ons, ons kan al, al maar in die school inneem met die ouderdom van 7 jaar tot met 15 jaar. Tot 15 jaar. Ja. Dus is graad uh, 
Ach om Trento, wat is het? Grad 8 of Trento? Uh, van grad 1 tot grad 4. 4, grad 4. Okay. Daarna ons stuur hulle na Okangwadi toe. Oké, okay, raad toe, raad toe. En hoe lang is jy nou al met die bezigheid in elkaar? Ek is nou om Trent 7 jaar hier zo in en hierdie omgeving. In hierdie omgeving. Mm. Maar jou school is een mobiele school, net so as het droog is op een plek, dan trek jy mense, dan moet jy achter hulle aantrek. Natuurlijk, ja. <laughs> ja. En hier is jou huis hier so, jou, jou kantoor en alles. Ja, 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 ja. Oké, okay, en jy het hier so twee richting radio so jy kan communikeer met die buitenwereld, nee? Ja, 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 ja. Ja, ja. Ah, ja, die regering, hulle voorzien hulle nou met die millimeer. Ja, ja, ja. Ek, en nou hier so by die plek, ek, ek krijg ons nou 36 uh, uh, sake per maand. Ja. Wat ek nou vir hulle bykie so kom kook, hulle eet nou to, to twee keer. Per dag. per dag. Voor die school en na die school. Na die school. Ja, ja. Hulle het hulle eie vlees, hulle eie melk, maar hulle het nie gewoonlik meel nie. Dit help hulle nou baie om bykie uh, koolhydrate in te kry nie. Natuurlijk, ja. En sê vir my, kry hulle bykie olie ook of nie? Is het hulle van... kry ons nie olie nie. O, hulle kry nie olie nie? Ja, ja. Oké. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Eer van hulle. Ja, o, is sy nou, hoe oud is, wat er graad is sy nou? Om te... Sy is nou 1 graad 3. Graad 3, oké, okay. oké. Ja. Okay. Als je een poort, is je hier bang dat je is. Ja. Goed wat er liggen maakt. Nee. Ja, ja, ja. Ja, ja, ja. Maar het is niet zo vaak dat je het niet telt. Ja, ja. The months of the year in the Herero language. This poster depicts permanent dwellings and structures found elsewhere in Namibia. A Mahangu container is used by the agronomical Uvambu and Kavangu tribes from the northern and eastern parts of Namibia, something the nomadic Himba children are not familiar with. We set up camp at Ochikoyo. With me, I had Piet, my trusted Himba guide. We started making inquiries about the possible whereabouts of any hunter-gatherers in the mountains, lying just behind us. Some of the younger members of the group confirmed to Piet that they indeed knew where they were to be found. The remoteness of and our lack of knowledge about the area persuaded us to take one of them with us the following day. The next morning, long before sunrise, we started walking. Immediately ahead lay a rise of 1300 meters and as I would discover later, a 40 kilometer hike. After half an hour of walking, we could still see the mobile school behind us. The felt was generally lush, with tall grass, and the trees had not been browsed as if mowed by an inverted lawn mower, always a sure sign of the presence of goats. At the top of the mountain, we unexpectedly came across a natural water hole, with evidence of camping under this magnificent specimen of a brown ivory tree. Pete pointed out that the camp was a base camp of the honey people, where they stayed over while collecting wild honey during winter. Yeah. Ja, hulle les vir tis nie vier, elke het sy ee warm. Ja. En hierdie boom is die boom, die boom moet die alle, waar die pessie sit, nee. Ja, hulle, hulle jeet. Ja. 
En dan nie net sommer hier na by is ek so draai, daar so is die krimmetatboom, nee. Ja, krimmetatboom en by die... Waar hulle die ening uithaal. Ja. Kom ons gaan kyk gauw bykie. Ok. Ok. Kyk die krimmetatboom, nee. Ja. Hulle kry net die ening bij gedaan so. Ening by? Ja, hulle kap. Ja, ja. Hulle kap, hulle klim net hier so. Ja. Toe hulle klim en hulle kap om. Ja, en daar is die gat, nee. Ja, en daar is die gat. En dan gebruik die palen daar so om op te klim, nee. Ja, om te op op te klim. Ja. Nou, ek sien nie sien nou by jy nie. Nee. Waar, wanneer kom jy by jy? Kom jy later ander tijd? Ja, kom jy later ander. Ja, ja, ja. Is dit by die winter of voor die somer? Wanneer is dit by jy? According to Pitt, the honey of these wild black bees is not harvested, but their presence stimulate honey production of African honeybees. We replenished our water supplies and continued our search ever deeper into the Baines Mountains. By late afternoon, we had searched most of the area above 2,000 meters without success. With the hazy zebra mountains now visible in the west, I realized that we had nearly crossed the entire plateau and began to doubt that we were ever going to find the honey people. And then suddenly, there they were, the honey people of the Baines Mountains. Finally, we had found the last two hunter-gatherers of Namibia. They were, in fact, the Chimbas, a subgroup of the Himba tribal group. After introductions and noticing our exhaustion, they invited us to join them, sitting in the shade of the nearest tree. It was the most beautiful and rarest sight to be seen. There was not a single bull, cow or ox, nor goats, nor donkeys, nor horses, nor pigs, nor chickens to be seen. There were no kraals, no cattle dung, and no cattle tracks. We were now, for the first time ever, amongst a group of true hunter-gatherers. This is a rumki, an ancient three-stringed musical instrument, originally from Arabia, but introduced to Africa by the Portuguese seafarers during the 1600s. Astoundingly, and most unusually, they almost all had blue-green eyes. Where did they originate from? They indicated that they and their parents had always been living in the Baines Mountains, but their forefathers had come from Angola. They were the only remaining group of Ochimbas in the Baines Mountains. Some of their distant family members still lived across the Kunini in Angola, near Serra Kaferma, though not as hunter-gatherers anymore. No time was wasted in starting to smoke the tobacco that we had brought along as a gift. Their quiet self-confidence was noticeable. They were clearly in a healthy state and not suffering from malnutrition. Their demeanor was positive in every respect, suggesting a surprising degree of well-being, both physical and mental. It was agreed that some of the younger men would take us to show how they gathered food in the felt and how they collected honey the next day. They were not allowed to hunt antelopes such as impala, which occurs plentifully in the mountains, 
or other bigger gain due to a ban by the Namibian government with stiff fines or jail sentences awaiting transgressors. They were not deterred from hunting though, but it was practiced clandestinely since the neighboring Himbers were often paid to report any poaching. With much fun and a wink-wink approach, because they didn't trust Mahimba guides, and with laughter from the remainder of the group, a young man proceeded to demonstrate how they would stalk Impala. The construction of their bows and arrows was very different to that of the Vatwas that we had found in the Zebra Mountains, although the arrow tips were also forged from steel. The group then departed to their makeshift huts while we set up camp under a nearby tree after a day of very hard walking and mountain climbing. Although the women's dress superficially resembled that of the Himba, it was in fact different. It takes an expert to recognize the differences though. The place where they were currently staying was known as Ochi Zoo. There was sufficient food in the area at that time and drinking water was available five kilometers from there. They stayed some distance from the water to avoid malarial mosquitoes. Again, it was remarkable how little water they needed. The group of 30 individuals in total required only 20 liters of water per day, which the children would fetch every other day. I learned that I was the first white person ever to have visited them at Ochi Zoo. For dinner, they were preparing pumpkin which they had traded from a Himba woman who, with her two daughters, lived not too far away. A bowl of fruits from the brown ivory tree and five liters of water was given to us as a gesture of goodwill. The water was worth its weight in gold. Pitt relished the wild fruit and I could now drink as much water as I wanted. Dark clouds began building up towards evening. We had brought no waterproof clothing or camping gear along. The Uchimba saw our dilemma and cleared out one of their huts for us. They are putting it mildly, not waterproof. I tried to get Pete to fill him in front of the hut, but this was the best he could do. As the sun set, the Zebra Mountains were still visible in the distance. started raining lightly. We suddenly had 15 visitors. Somehow they all fitted into our hut. The Uchimbas were clearly in the mood to socialize with the strangers. At sunrise it was still raining. Fortunately, a break in the weather occurred soon thereafter, giving us an opportunity to do what we had come for, to find out more about the hunter-gatherers. After walking a distance of about three kilometers from the huts, we came upon an area where the Uchimbas showed us some felt foods. The Uchimba language contains no clicking sound, suggesting that they are not directly descendant from the sun. Mm. 
These bulbs, resembling small potatoes, were cooked in the fire later that day for me to taste. It is very rich in oil and tastes and has the consistency of Brazil nuts. We walked another few kilometers to the hut of the Himba woman who, with her two daughters, plants and trades her pumpkins, wild watermelons, maize and other vegetables for honey from the Ochimbas. I inquired about the purpose of a strange looking conically shaped utensil made from the branches and bark of the Mopani tree. The woman arranged her body ornaments over it but was shy to answer me. One of the Ochihimbas volunteered. The utensil is used by women during menstruation. Since water is sometimes simply not available for anything but drinking, they cannot wash themselves properly. By placing some green mopani leaves on top of some burning coals under the utensil, while sitting over it, they are able to cleanse and dehodorize themselves with the smoke emanating from the smoldering leaves. These ropes are also made from the bark of the mopani tree. Its uses include hut construction. We were offered some honey beer made from one part honey, one part mahongo and one part water that is allowed to ferment for a few days in a container before drinking. I found it most tasty and refreshing with a low alcoholic content. The presentation was somewhat different to what would be considered acceptable in the industrialized world. <laughs> <laughs> Although not the season for collecting honey, I asked the Ochimbas to show me how and where they collected wild honey. They took me in another direction, two kilometers away. To an area where numerous calabashes had been inserted amongst dense bushes to make sure that honey badgers could not gain access. The calabashes were spaced tens of meters apart. The felt was in pristine condition, not having been grazed or browsed by cattle or goats allowing the indigenous plants to grow and flower so that there was plenty of nectar for the bees from which to make honey. The range of flowers was astounding considering how dry the area can become. As the clouds began to lift, we could again see the zebra mountains far in the distance. It was time for a smoke break. The Ochimbas have their own way of making fire. They use a small piece of steel as a striker plate a chip taken from a rock as a flintstone and some finely ground comophora charcoal to produce fire. The fact that it was a rainy day with lots of moisture in the air made the task a little bit more difficult. Well 
We reached a cluster of trees carrying beehives that have been in existence for generations. Since it was outside the harvesting season, the Uchimbas could only demonstrate how they obtained their honey from the hives, with some humour. Notice how the bark has grown over the stones used to plug old holes in the tree trunk over the years. Even the dogs depend on felt foods, here seen also eating the fruits of the brown ivory tree, reminding us that our limited supplies were running out. We could not expect our hunter-gatherer friends to continue providing us with food and water. We reluctantly had to turn back. When saying our farewells, I could not help but to envy them for the exceptional quality of their lifestyle, which they were able to sustain on such meager natural resources. As we set off on our long journey back, I became intensely aware of the almost infinite divide that separated our two cultures. As we reached the bottom of the mountain, on Mother Earth again so to speak, the only sign reminding us of our experience in the mountain was this lonely cloud suspended halfway up the Baines Mountains, the last of those that had brought the rain. After my return from Namibia, driving along the busy roads past Johannesburg, I could not help but to draw a comparison in my mind between the lifestyle of the hunter-gatherers that we just experienced and that of the modern world. How is it possible that man has succeeded to become so caught up in a lifestyle that requires so much of the earth's resources to be sustained, in a never-ending quest to produce and consume ever more material goods? How long can man still continue living under the illusion that his quality of life is purely a function of his ability to produce and consume material goods, and even to continue expanding this ability further simply through mere increased technical innovation? People living in the first, I should say industrialized world, today are all aware that they are using up a disproportionate amount of the earth's limited available resources. And if their lifestyle were to be extended to the whole of the population of this earth, it does not take a rocket scientist to see that something simply will have to give. The mere fact that this state of affairs has been reached today is already sufficient evidence against the false premise that man can escape from this inevitable fact simply by relying on more and more technical innovation and more and more economic growth. As the countries with huge populations, such as China, India and Indonesia, are now racing in the same direction, the urgency of reviewing this approach has become critical. The analogy of a huge train racing at full speed towards and into a mountain, without the driver questioning the presence of the mountain in the path of the train, comes to mind. In my view, the solution for dealing with this crisis does not ultimately lie in the adaptation of one or other of the well-known social models such as capitalism or socialism or grabbing at straw proposals such as increasing economic growth or some form of primitivism. It simply lies in realizing that the human population is now far exceeding the Earth's sustainable carrying capacity and the only solution if man's quality of life is to be restored fully lies in achieving a reduced population and to do it as quickly as possible 
before the damage caused by the present degree of overpopulation becomes irreversible. But before attempting to devise practical solutions aimed at achieving this objective, a question that would first have to be answered is, what would be an acceptable human population to aim for? The question is obviously not a simple one, and there clearly is no single correct answer to the question. That does not, however, mean that some target should not be set, however arbitrary. The fact is that as time goes on, the target can always be revised. The important thing is to have a target. For a start, the human population of the Earth just after the last ice age, approximately 10,000 years ago, may not be a bad target for the purpose, since at that time, all humans were still living in a more or less sustainable way with their natural environment. The above would represent a drastic reduction in the human population, but clearly cannot be achieved overnight. The proviso is that if it takes too long, too much irreversible damage might be done to the earth and its natural resources to allow recovery. The important thing is that a real start should be made. The population growths in many countries of the world have stabilized or are indeed on the decline. Those countries whose populations are still increasing at a significant rate, without exception or form part of what is commonly referred to as the developing world. The challenge in both instances is to convince individuals of the merits of the case and the dire need for a reduction in the world population. There is no need for the politicization of the issue in any partisan way whether political or religious. After all, we are all passengers on the same train, and do we really have any other choice? <laughs> Hey, <laughs> <laughs>